This is a this is a topic that has interested me for a long time. Um, it's about the emotional power of film and how it brings us together and how it can divide us. So after sharing a little personal experience with filmmaking, I'm going to touch on the emotional manipulation that film has and its capacity to distort reality. And I'm going to conclude with a pretty common sense thing. We have to be wary about how film can deepen the gap between us and them. And we have to embrace how film can bring us more closely together. Um, I'm not a film producer, but about 20 years ago, I tried to be. Uh, I produced a weird, quirky 22 minute film on Plato's allegory of the cave with a friend, Ken Nisley. Uh, we brainstormed the screenplay, scouted out the location, made costumes and props, recruited a film crew of eight cavers experienced in filming inside of caves, hired a second videographer, rented two Sony VX2000 cameras, tripods, batteries, shotgun mics. We piled all the equipment into Ken's car and drove for hours to a cheap Virginia motel near a remote cave for a single day shoot. Uh, we survived 12 hours of production at six locations deep inside this huge cave system. Uh, I'll ask Drew to, to share the two graphics now that, uh, that, that I, I dug up from my archives about the filming of this. The first is Ken at the mouth of the cave. We did a small section of that. Um, uh, uh, he's reacting to the brightness of the sun. And the second one you can move to is, uh, uh, we'd never, we didn't actually use the second image in the film, which was Ken uh, pounding a stake of a sign in, and the sign reads, if you can't read it, danger, philosophical metaphor. So we had a lot of fun. We crawled into that cave, that opening you can see uh, goes down and you can literally explore that cave for hours and hours and hours. Thanks, Drew. We can uh, stop screen share now, appreciate it. So the highlight, the highlight of that project was not the final project, uh, the final product, not the film, but the process of gathering a team together, working towards common goals, and, and the camaraderie we all felt, which was deep and real. Um, the generosity of the unpaid cavers who were friendly and positive about volunteering for a crazy project was really heartwarming. And when we all emerged from that cave at 1 a.m., we felt that we had shared something special. So in a way, film brought us together that way. Now, after that, things were less exhilarating. We struggled through months of post-production culminating in a film that was, for me, flawed and disappointing. It had its moments. Ken was a great actor, but what I had in my mind's eye was nothing like what we ended up with as a finished product. I wanted a film that smoothly mixed the conceptual richness of Plato's worldview with contemporary humor and social significance. I wanted a film that would bring people together around something I love, philosophy. It's not what I got. Now, anyone who knows anything about film could have predicted that outcome. There's no way that two relative amateurs with scarce resources and limited time could create an artful, philosophically rich video. But I was younger then, I had big dreams. I imagined a lot of them projected onto the silver screen. And these dreams are, are rooted in my childhood. My friend Kevin, who's on the call today, and I were involved in many film projects. My parents, when I was in eighth grade, my parents gave me a, a little Fuji eight millimeter camera and we made film after film. And I think that my interest in film grew out of many hours of, of filming, but also of watching, even at a very young age, way too much TV. My parents seemed to have other things to do than to entertain me. So they didn't mind that I welcomed into my life uh, and into my imagination, Captain Kangaroo, the Munsters and, and the crew of the SS Minnow on Gilligan's Island. A lot of my early emotional connection to life was through TV. The flickering images on the screen were mesmerizing, comforting. Illusion and reality mixed. 
which brings me back to Plato's allegory. Imagine being chained in an underground cave all of your life, able only to see shadows on a wall in front of you. So restrained, you wouldn't see the people behind you that are making the shadows. And the sounds of those people would echo off the wall, seemingly emanating from the shadows themselves. From your perspective, says Plato, quote, the truth would literally be nothing but the shadows of the images. You'd mistake illusion for reality. Now, Plato's allegory is much more involved. But for today, that little part of the story offers a very simple lesson. Don't be fooled into thinking that seeing is believing. Plato argued that reason, not our flawed senses, leads to knowledge. He was suspicious of the visual arts because it's all about illusion. It can fool us into seeing something that's not there. I mean, take the painting of an actual person. If it was particularly realistic from a distance, you might mistake the painting for an actual person. And you could mistakenly call out to them only to realize that as you got closer, there was no person there at all, only their image. Perceptions often deceive. And Plato was most critical of the dramatic arts because they not only rely on faulty senses, but they also stir up powerful emotions. Watching action on a stage, like in the Greek civic life, people can feel love or hate for fictional characters. And falling prey to such emotional manipulation, according to Plato, weakens reason and clouds our judgment. Plato warns of allowing art to guide our decisions regarding goodness or truth. Art should never trump reason. Well, I, I wouldn't bring Plato to a Broadway play with me. He'd be a buzzkill for sure. But should we be at all worried? Should we heed Plato at all? I mean, after all, as the pandemic keeps us further away from each other, but closer to our screens, do we too suspend rationality in, in favor of entertainment? Given how much time we stare at screens, binge watching Netflix, have we become that pitiful prisoner? Are we falling deeper into a cave of ignorance? How do we process all the films that we consume? Writer and director Gabriel Urbina says that it all depends on if we're talking about the films of fiction or the films that are documentaries. Addressing the fiction genre, Urbina's article, Stop Complaining About Films Manipulating You, that's the title of the article, has that clear message. He says, the whole point of fiction is to be manipulated. We love films when we fall under their spell, so to speak. We allow ourselves to be steered towards certain feelings, perspectives, and ideas. We suspend our belief. We accept narratives that are consistent, convincing, and emotionally powerful. We want that. Many storylines offer incredible catharsis, especially if they're about, oh, let's say an, an underdog overcoming a villain, right? It's not that we don't want to be manipulated, it's that we don't want to be manipulated badly. Manipulation works best when it's invisible, unnoticed. A single heavy-handed moment can break the spell. Urbina explains that we don't like when films gerrymander our feelings or rely on various ploys that strong arm us into a specific reaction. When the music is overly dramatic or when the plot becomes too predictable, we can detach and become critical. Urbina offers examples of overly manipulative films. He says, Terms of Endearment uh, is one from way back, Slumdog Millionaire, and he says, quote, anything in the Steven Spielberg category. But tastes are relative, right? I mean, I love almost all Steven Spielberg films. Maybe that's because I'm a sucker for manipulation. I enjoyed Slumdog Millionaire. 
I realized that my willingness to be manipulated by film depends on my mood. Sometimes I want a movie to work and I'm ready to accept any level of manipulation. And other times I'm in no mood to suspend my disbelief, especially if a film is leading me to feelings or thoughts that are uncomfortable or that make me feel embarrassed or guilty. But I think that we can agree that regarding fiction, manipulation isn't always so bad, right? Now, when it comes to documentaries, man manipulation is much more problematic because I think we hold documentarians to a higher standard of truth. We give them less latitude than filmmakers portraying fictional worlds. We give them, uh, generally, we assume that documentarians accurately reflect at least some part of the world around us. And we condemn outright those who rearrange footage, for example, in the editing room intentionally to distort reality. If you interview somebody and then select words and rearrange them so they say something they never said, that's clearly going over the line. But can't documentaries appeal to our emotions? I mean, I, I just watched and loved the documentary Knock Down the House, especially the feelings that whipped up in me at its conclusion. So watch it. This is not a recommendation for a candidate or a party. Knock down the house on Netflix. So I wonder, can't documentaries take a point of view? And what if they portray partial truths? Or is truth so precious that documentary filmmakers have to be held to an even higher ethical standard? What is the connection between ethics and filmmaking as a craft? Well, in thinking about this, I, I, I read a little bit more about the German director, Lenny Reifenstahl, who died in 2003 at the age of 101. Students of film praise her cinematographic techniques like dramatic angles or extreme close-ups or sweeping panoramas and rousing soundtracks, and also using cameras on rails for smooth moving shots. Many of her films explored athletics, like mountaineering and sports. Uh, the mountaineering were, films were particularly popular in Germany because there was a big pull towards looking at man's struggle with nature. And she did films on the Olympics that celebrated the aesthetics of athletic bodies. But regardless of her technical prowess, Reifenthal was condemned because she worked for the Nazi party for a while. She drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak, at a rally that Hitler spoke at in 1932. And it was almost like she was drugged. She wrote after the film, this is how she felt. She said, I had an almost ap apocalyptic vision I was never able to forget. It seemed as if the earth's surfaces were spreading out in front of me, like a hemisphere that suddenly splits apart in the middle, spewing out enormous jets of water, so powerful that it touched the sky and shook the earth. After seeing one of her films, Hitler, was infatuated with her. He described Reifenthal as being the ideal of Aryan womanhood. And he convinced her to film a 1933 Nazi rally at Nuremberg the following year that ended up as the infamous, the triumph of the will. She had a cast of 700,000 Germans in mass formation. And the film became known as one of the greatest propaganda films of all time. Pageantry, regimentation, martial music, punctuated by speeches from Hitler and other leaders, proclaimed to the world the superiority of the German people of Nordic descent. It created whipped up feelings of dangerously powerful German identity that was a we, an us. But this unifying Nazi identity, bringing many Germans together, also created this strong sense of them, of others outside of the common identity and the sphere of empathy that the Nazis emphasized. Reifenstahl denied consciously promoting evil us them polarity, but clearly she was under Hitler's spell. In a 1937 interview with the Detroit News, she revealed herself as a true believer. Quote, to me, Hitler is the greatest man who ever lived. He truly is without fault, so simple and at the same time possessed of masculine strength. In one of her last interviews, Reifenstahl told the BBC that she admitted that she erred. She said, 
I was one of millions who thought Hitler had all the answers. We saw only good things. We didn't know bad things were to come. And her films portrayed a seductive sense of fascist unity. And that's the problem and, and, and the power of film. It's particularly well suited for claiming absolute truths, for painting the world in black and white, for drawing a clear line between good and evil. I mean, with a book, a reader's more in control. You can put the book down or pause or look back at previous chapters. Same thing with a painting. You can go up to it close. You can see it at any angle for any length of time. But watching a movie is like getting on an escalator. And you generally stay on it until it ends. So the filmmaker can hammer your feelings freely. Repeated images and phrases can penetrate deeper and convince you to take a point of view or feel certain feelings. And it can really enforce binary thinking. This good, evil, hero, villain. And in Hitler's Germany, the pure goodness of the Nordic race that was a part of these films also implied the inherent inferiority of others. And soon this powerful Aryan us created an indelible them. And Jews and Romani and homosexuals and Jehovah's Witnesses, people with disabilities and others were all lumped together as inferiors, as targets for extermination. There was no room for subtlety or complexities in Nazi ethic. Complete dedication to the cause was demanded in order to assure mass mobilization and national glory. So as Hitler declared to an adoring crowd in triumph of the will, quote, as soon as our own propaganda admits so much as a glimmer of right on the other side, the foundation for doubt in our own right has been laid. In other words, we can't let a glimmer of truth or empathy go to the other side. And film and propaganda is aimed at eliminating all doubt. Now, the United States developed early expertise in propaganda too. Uh, in, in around World War I, the Committee for Public Information was created by Woodrow Wilson to rally US participation in World War I and to help to make, make the world safe for democracy. Wilson tapped George Creel to head the CPI. And, and at that point, propaganda didn't have such a negative connotation as it does now. Creel emphasized that the German Republic was not noble propaganda, but US propaganda was, quote, not propaganda as the Germans defined it, but propaganda in the true sense of the world, meaning the propagation of faith, the propagation of faith. So the Committee on Public Information was given unprecedented power. They had four minute men, they were called, people who would show up at entertainment venues and before movies and give a four minute speech that hammered the, basically the administration uh, portrayal of German atrocities and innocent victims. And CPI was really the first mass spin organization. In fact, what people call spinning today was called Creeling for the head of the CPI, George Creeling. And the United States got into World War I. But it really took until World War II for the US government to start producing effective feature films to generate public support for war and to demonize our enemies. And there are many examples of these films. Uh, two that just, I, I, I was studying Confessions of a Nazi Spy in 1939. In 1941, the tanks are coming. That was pre-Pearl Harbor. When I was growing up, 1968, John Wayne was in the film, The Green Berets. I think I saw it with my friend Kevin, actually. And it very temporarily deceived my little 11 year old brain about US policy in Vietnam. I was initially in all in favor of going out there and beating the commies. It didn't take long. I think at 12, I had turned the corner. And by the time in 1978, the deer hunter, which showed some of the uglier aspects of war, by that time, most Americans had seen through our government's propaganda of the 60s. But films are so effective at manipulating us that as a nation, we can become convinced to send our children to die in foreign lands. That's how powerful film can do to reinforce a tribal paradigm of us versus them. And I've spoken a lot, especially recently, about this tribal nature 
of humanity, how often our reptilian brains are hijacked by fear. It drives us to divide our species into good and evil. I recently wrote that column about how even in my quaint little neighborhood of 17,000 people in Tacoma Park, I can let my impulses divide me from my neighbors. So no wonder a country of 320 million people is increasingly siloed and desperate people are becoming more and more divided. And today with constant campaign advertisements, especially for those of you in Pennsylvania, have deepened the divide that we feel. And it seems like we're on the brink of civil war. Well, it was the real civil war that actually reawakened my interest in how film can divide and unify. More accurately, I was awakened by the civil war as portrayed by Ken Burns. Almost half a lifetime ago, my lifetime ago, back in 1990, Ken Burns released the ninth episode exploration of the single most divisive time in American history. And ironically, the film about past division brought the country together a bit. It captured 39 million viewers. It was the most watched program ever to air on PBS. It became a topic for conversation at work and at home. And the Civil War series made Burns a household name. I mean, Apple computers named one of their Final Cut Pro editing features, the Ken Burns effect. But from a distance perspective, Burns appears unaffected by his fame. He lives modestly in Walpole, New Hampshire. He doesn't put on a lot of airs. And in interviews, he seems pretty humble and open and eager to share both his successes and his, weak, his mistakes that he's made. And when I got up the courage to introduce myself to him on a northbound Amtrak train, he wasn't annoyed. He became actually animated almost when I mentioned that my son was in his first year at Hampshire College. And, and Burns credits his own time as an undergraduate at Hampshire College for teaching him that there is never only one perspective on history. You always have to look through different modalities. To weave an authentic national narrative, you have to include many perspectives. You can't seize on only one perspective, one definition of who is the we, who is the us. More specifically, given that history is all too often written by the winners, Ken Burns says that you have to include bottom up voices, especially in the United States when it comes to issues of class and race. He talks a lot about how race is a powerful dynamic in history. It's in almost all of his documentaries. He said he couldn't escape it. Now, some criticized the Civil War series over some issues that have to do with race. Some said that the series allowed the lost cause myth to live on, the pseudo historical myth that minimizes the evils of slavery and attributes more nobility to the Confederate case than it deserves. And there might be a little truth in that criticism. I don't think you ever get history right. And in the times of Black Lives Matter, that's maybe a bigger problem than I, I realized 30 years ago. But what Burns was trying to do was to draw people together by retelling the Civil War. And he tried to bring history alive. Burns said that what drives him to do his work is an urge to wake the dead, to bring back those dead from long ago and sit them in our living room so that they could tell our story. Film can help overcome that gap in time because the distant past and the present can become one through film. And Burns helps us understand who we are as a country as a collection of people with a complicated and sometimes beautiful and sometimes ugly shared story. Burns speaks poignantly about when he was a young boy. His mother died of cancer and feeling alone and isolated, he began to feel connected with his father because they watched war documentaries together. His father was a veteran. And Ken Burns said that he never saw his father cry until one of those documentaries brought the loss that was in that war, the loss of soldiers and colleagues back to life. 
And Burns said that right then and right there, he realized the power of film to connect. And he credits that moment for helping him make his way into film. And today, Burns emphasizes how films can draw us together in all our complexity and multiplicity. It can create a we without needing to create, create a them. Few people bring people together as well as Burns does. Diametrically opposed people. In all of his di documentaries, differences between people are transcended by what they have in common. He portrays people as doing their best, best to make the most of life's twists and turns, showing our, our shared foibles and our, our feet of clay. And he helps bond us together to say that we are an us as a people. And right now, the nation is so painfully divided, it's hard to see that. Sometimes we ache for a sense of unity. In an interview this past summer with Mar Marvin Kalb, Burns reflected on the confluence of so many explosive social issues, from political polarization to the pandemic to the fight for black lives. He points about how even wearing masks isolate us from each other. And the wide variety of news outlets made it harder for us to feel that we share one national story. I mean, my goodness, two town halls with the two candidates for presidency at the same time? We're so siloed that we're denied opportunities to be involved in the same debate. But Burns is actually, with all of that, pretty optimistic. He has faith that our country and the truth will ultimately bring us together. He admits he may be wrong. He doesn't pretend to have some omniscient view of history. He has a point of view about the past and he tries to get it across. I mean, he even admits that what he does for a living is manipulation. He says that all stories are manipulation. They drive us to laugh or to cry, but he insists that films can build social cohesion. He says that what he, that's what he's trying to do, emphasize an us and a we in our attempt to create an, an identity as a nation. We're still so young. And we're still trying to understand what an inclusive democracy looks like. When Burns is asked about a president who now is our divider in chief, Burns says that what we have in common, our shared dreams, our desire for unity, will hold us together. He, Burns said, there's no such thing as a pro-American history. We only have one history, and a lot of it isn't pretty. Only by teaching and understanding in all the complexities and contradictions will we make our country better, end quote. So in conclusion, I'll just ask the question, can film connect us more than divide us? When you're watching those campaign ads, are they connecting us or dividing us? We will only be able to make use of film in a way that connects us if we become increasingly aware of its power to manipulate. If we become critical viewers, if we become more intentional, only then can we be in control of whether we feel more connected to others despite differences. Only when then can we actually choose to see our still evolving nation as one struggling to come closer together for our common humanity. Happy viewing. Thank you.